Chapter Eleven, Part Four of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mysteries of Paris by Eugène Sue. Chapter Eleven, Part Four. Madame d'Harville hid her face in her hands. Overcome by this painful disclosure, she had not courage to add another word. Rodolph also remained silent. His mind recoiled, affrighted from the terrible mysteries of this night he pictured to himself the young maiden already sad in consequence of her return to the city in which her mother had died arriving at a strange house alone with a man for whom she felt an interest and esteem but not love nor any of those sentiments which enchant the mind none of the engrossing feeling which removes the chaste alarms of a woman in the participation of a lawful and reciprocal affection no no on the contrary clemence arrived agitated and distressed with depressed spirits and tearful eyes she was however resolved on resignation and the fulfilment of duty when instead of listening to language full of devotion love and tenderness which would compensate for the sorrowful feelings which were uppermost in her mind she sees convulsed at her feet a stricken man who twists and foams and shrieks in the hideous convulsions of one of the most fearful infirmities with which a man can be incurably smitten this is not all his child poor little innocent angel is also withered from her birth these sad and painful avowals excited bitter reflections in rodolph's mind such said he is the law of the land a young handsome and pure girl the confiding and gentle victim of a shameful dissimulation unites her destiny to that of a man tainted with an incurable malady a fatal inheritance which he will assuredly transmit to his children the unhappy wife discovers this horrid mystery what can she do nothing nothing but suffer and weep nothing but endeavour to overcome her disgust and fright nothing but pass her days in anguish in indefinable and endless terror nothing but seek perhaps culpable consolation without the desolate existence which has been created around her again said rodolph these strange laws sometimes produce horrible unions fearful for humanity in these laws animals always appear superior to man in the care bestowed upon them in the improvements that are studied for them in the protection which encircles the guarantees which attend them by an animal and if an infirmity decried by the law is detected after the purchase the sale is null and void indeed what a shame what a case of public injury would it be to compel a man to keep an animal which has a cough is lame or has lost an eye why it would be scandalous criminal unheard of infamy only imagine being compelled to keep and keep for ever a mule with a cough a horse that was blind or an ass that was lame what frightful consequences might not such injustice entail on the community therefore no such bargains hold good no words bind no contract is valid the omnipotent law unlooses all that was bound but if it relates to a creature made after god's own image if it respects a young girl who in the full and innocent reliance on the good faith of a man unites her lot with his and wakes up in the company of an epileptic an unhappy wretch stricken with a fearful malady whose moral and physical consequences are immeasurably distressing a malady which may throw disorder and aversion into a family perpetuate a horrible disease vitiate whole generations yes this law so inexorable when lame blind or coughing animals are the consideration this law so singularly clear-sighted which will not allow an unsound horse to increase the species this law will not loosen the victim of a union such as we have described these bonds are sacred indissoluble it is to offend god and man to break them in truth continued rodolph men sometimes display a humility most shameful and an egotistical pride which is only execrable he values himself at less than the beast which he protects by warranties which he refuses for himself and he imposes on himself makes sacred and perpetuates his most distressing infirmities by putting them under the protection of the immutability of laws human and divine rodolph greatly blamed m d'harville but he promised to himself to excuse him in the eyes of clemence although fully persuaded after her sad disclosure that the marquis was for ever alienated from her heart one thought led to another and rodolph said to himself 
i have kept aloof from a woman i love and who perhaps already feels a secret inclination for me either from an attachment of heart or friendship she has bestowed her honour her life for the sake of a fool whom she thought unhappy if instead of leaving her i had paid her all sorts of attentions love and consideration my name would have been such that her reputation would not have received the slightest stain the suspicions of her husband would never have been excited whilst now she is all but at the mercy of such an ass as m charles robert who i fear will become the more indiscreet in proportion as he has the less right to be so and then too who knows if in spite of the dangers she has risked the heart of madame d'harville will always remain free any return to her husband is henceforward impossible young handsome courted with a disposition sympathizing with all who suffer what dangers what shoals and quicksands lie before her for m d'harville what anguish and what deep chagrin at the same time jealous of and in love with his wife who cannot subdue the disgust and fright which he excited in her on their nuptials what a lot is his clemence with her forehead hidden by her hands her eyes brimful of tears and her cheek reddened by embarrassment avoided rodolph's look such pain had the disclosure cost her ah now said rodolph after a long silence i can understand the cause of m d'harville's sadness which i could not before account for i can imagine his regrets his regrets exclaimed clemence say his remorse monseigneur if he have any for never was such a crime more coolly meditated a crime madame what else is it my lord to bind to yourself an indissoluble bounds a young girl who confides in your honour when you are fatally stricken with a malady which inspires fear and horror what else is it to devote with certainty an unhappy child to similar misery what forced m d'harville to make two victims a blind insensate passion no he found my birth my fortune and my person to his taste he wished to make a convenient marriage because doubtless a bachelor's life wearied him madame at least pity him pity him if you wish pity pray let it be bestowed on my child poor victim of this odious union what nights and days have i passed near her what tears have not her misfortunes wrung from me but her father suffers from the same unmerited afflictions yet it is that father who has condemned her to a sickly infancy a withering youth and if she should survive to a life of isolation and misery for she will never marry ah oh, no i love her too well to expose her to the chance of one day's weeping over her own offspring similarly smitten as i weep over her i have suffered too much from treachery to render myself guilty of or an accomplice in such wickedness you are right the vengeance of your mother-in-law was really atrocious but patience and perhaps in your turn you will be avenged said rodolph after a moment's reflection what do you mean my lord inquired clemence astonished at the change in his voice i have generally had the satisfaction of seeing those whom i have known to be wicked most severely punished he replied in a voice that made clemence shudder but the day after this unhappy event what did your husband say he confessed with singular candour that his two former marriages had been broken off in consequence of the family's becoming acquainted with the secret of his fearful malady thus then after having been twice rejected he had the shameful the unmanly courage to drag a third poor victim into the abyss of misery the kind intervention of friends had preserved the others from and this is what the world calls a gentleman and a man of honour for one so good so full of pity to others yours are harsh words because i feel i have been unworthily treated m d'harville easily penetrated the girlish openness of my character why then did he not trust to my sympathy and generosity of feeling and tell me the whole truth because you would have refused him this very expression proves how guilty he was and how treacherous was his conduct if he really entertained the idea of my rejecting his hand if informed of the truth he loved you too well to incur the risk of losing you no no my lord had he really loved me he would never have sacrificed me to his selfish passion nay so wretched was my position at that time and such was my desire to quit my father's roof that had he been candid and explicit with me 
it is more than probable he would have moved me to pity the species of misery he was condemned to endure and to sympathize with one so cut off from the tender ties which sweeten life i really believe at this moment that touched by his open manly confession as well as interested for one labouring under so severe an affliction of the almighty's hand i should scarcely have had the courage to refuse him my hand and once aware of all i had undertaken nothing should have deterred me from the full and conscientious discharge of every solemn duty towards him but to compel this pity and interest merely because he had me in his power and to exact my consideration and sympathy because unhappily i was his wife and had sworn to obligations the full force of which had been concealed from me was at once the act of a coward and a wrong judging mind how could i hold myself bound to endure the heavy penalties of my unfortunate marriage when my husband had trampled on every tie which binds an honourable mind and now my lord you may form some little idea of my wedded life you are now aware how shamefully i was deceived and that too by the person in whose hands i unsuspectingly placed the future happiness of my whole existence i had implicitly trusted in m d'harville and he had most dishonourably and treacherously repaid my trustfulness with bitter and irremediable wrongs the gentle timid melancholy which had so greatly interested me in his favour and which he attributed to pious recollections was in truth only the workings of a conscience ill at ease and the knowledge of his own incurable infirmity still were he a stranger or an enemy a heart so noble and generous as yours would pity such sufferings as he endures but can i calm those sufferings if he could distinguish my voice or if only a look of recognition answered my sorrowing glance but no oh my lord it is impossible for such as have never seen them to form an idea of those frightful paroxysms in which every sense is suspended and the unfortunate sufferer merely recovers from his frenzy to fall into a sort of sullen dejection when my dear child experiences one of these attacks it almost breaks my heart to see her tender frame twisted stiffened and distorted by the dreadful convulsions which accompany it still she is my own my beloved infant and when i see her bitter agonies my hatred and aversion to her father are increased an hundredfold but when my poor child becomes calmer so does my irritation against my husband subside also and then ah then the natural tenderness of my heart makes my angry feelings give place to a species of sorrow and pity for him yet surely i did not marry at only seventeen years of age merely to experience the alternations of hatred and painful commiseration and to weep over a frail and sickly infant whom after all i may not be permitted to rear and as regards this beloved object of my incessant prayers permit me my lord to anticipate a reproach i doubtless deserve and which you would be unwilling to make my daughter young as she is is capable of interesting my affections and fully occupying my heart but the love she inspires is so cruelly mixed with present anguish and future apprehensions that my tenderness for my child invariably ends in tears and bitter grief when i am with her my heart is torn with agony a heavy crushing weight presses on my heart at the thoughts of her hopeless suffering state not all the fondest devices of a mother's love can overcome a malady pronounced by all our faculty as incurable thus then by way of relief and refuge from the atmosphere of wretchedness which surrounded me i had pictured to myself the possibility of finding calm and repose for my troubled spirit in an attachment so vain so empty that but i have been deceived a second time most unworthily deceived and there is now nothing left for me but to resign myself to the gloom and misery of the life my husband's want of candour has entailed upon me but tell me my lord is it such an existence as i was justified in expecting when i bestowed my hand on m d'harville and am i alone to blame for those injuries to avenge which my husband had this day determined to take my life my fault was great very great and the more so because the object i had selected was every way so unworthy and leaves me the additional shame of having to blush for my choice happily for me my lord the conversation you overheard between the countess sarah and her brother on the subject of m charles robert spares me much of the humiliation i should otherwise have experienced in making this confession i only venture to hope that since listening to my relation 
you may be induced to consider me as much an object of pity as i admit i am of blame i cannot express to you madame how deeply your narrative has touched me what gnawing grief what hidden sorrows have you not been called upon to endure from the death of your mother to the birth of your child who would ever believe such ills could reach one so envied so admired and so calculated to enjoy and impart happiness to others oh my lord there are some sorrows so deep so unapproachable that for worlds we would not even have them suspected and the severest increase of suffering would arise from the very doubt of our being the enviable creatures we are believed to be you are right nothing would be more painful than the question openly expressed is she or is he as happy as they seem to be still if there is any happiness in the knowledge be assured you are not the only one who has to struggle with the fearful contrast between reality and that which the world believes how so my lord because in the eyes of all who know you your husband is esteemed even happier than yourself since he possesses one so rich in every good gift and yet is not he also much to be pitied can there be a more miserable existence than the one he leads he has acted unfairly and selfishly towards you but has he not been bitterly punished he loves you with a passion deep and sincere worthy of you to have inspired yet he knows that your only feeling towards him is insurmountable aversion and contempt in his feeble suffering child he beholds a constant reproach nor is that all he is called upon to endure jealousy also assails him with her nameless tortures and how can i help that my lord by giving him no occasion for jealousy you reply and certainly you are right but think you because no other person would possess my love it would any the more be his he knows full well it would not since the fearful scene i related to you we have lived entirely apart while in the eyes of the world i have kept up every necessary appearance of married happiness with the exception of yourself my lord i have never breathed a syllable of this fatal secret to mortal ears thus therefore i venture to ask advice of you i could not solicit from any human being and i madame can with truth assure you that if the trifling service i have rendered you be deemed worthy of notice i hold myself a thousand times overpaid by the confidence you have reposed in me but since you deign to ask my advice and permit me to speak candidly oh yes my lord i beseech you to use the frankness and sincerity you would show to a sister then allow me to tell you that for want of employing one of your most precious qualities you lose vast enjoyments which would not only fill up that void in your heart but would distract you from your domestic sorrows and supply that need of stirring emotions excitement and added the prince smiling i dare almost to venture to add pray forgive me for having so bad an opinion of your sex that natural love for mystery and intrigue which exercises so powerful an empire over many if not all females what do you mean my lord i mean that if you would play at the game of doing good nothing would please or interest you more madame d'harville surveyed rodolph with astonishment and understand resumed he i speak not of sending large sums carelessly almost disdainfully to unfortunate creatures of whom you know nothing and who are frequently undeserving of your favour but if you would amuse yourself as i do at playing from time to time at the game of providence you would acknowledge that occasionally our good deeds put on all the piquancy and charms of a romance i must confess my lord said clemence with a smile it never occurred to me to class charity under the head of amusements it is a discovery i owe to my horror of all tediums all wearisome long protracted affairs a sort of horror which has been principally inspired by long political conferences and ministerial discussions but to return to our game of amusing beneficence i cannot alas aspire to possess that disinterested virtue which makes some people content to entrust others with the office of either ill or well distributing their bounty and if it merely required me to send one of my chamberlains to carry a few hundred louis to each of the divisions in and around paris i confess to my shame that the scheme would not interest me nearly as much as it does at present while doing good after my notions on the subject is one of the most entertaining and exciting amusements you can imagine i prefer the word amusing because to me it conveys the idea of all that pleases charms and allures us and really madame 
if you would only become my accomplice in a few dark intrigues of this sort you would see that apart from the praiseworthiness of the action nothing is really more curious inviting attractive or diverting than these charitable adventures and then what mystery is requisite to conceal the benefits we render what precautions to prevent ourselves from being discovered what varied yet powerful emotions are excited at the aspect of poor but worthy people shedding tears of joy and calling down heaven's blessing on your head depend upon it such a group is after all more gratifying than the pale angry countenance of either a jealous or an unfaithful lover and there are very few who do not class either under one head or the other the emotions i describe are closely allied to those you experienced this morning while going to the rue du temple simply dressed that you may escape observation you go forth with a palpitating heart you also ascend with a throbbing breast some modest fiacre carefully drawing down the blinds to prevent yourself from being seen then looking cautiously from side to side that you are not observed you quickly enter a mean-looking dwelling just like this morning you see the only difference being that whereas to-day you said if i am discovered i am lost then you would only smile as you mentally uttered if i am discovered they will overwhelm me with praises and blessings now since you possess your many adorable qualities in all their pure modesty you would employ the most artful schemes the most complicated manoeuvres to prevent yourself from being known and consequently wept over and blessed as an angel of goodness ah oh, my lord cried madame d'harville deeply moved you are indeed my preserver i cannot express the new ideas the consoling hopes awakened within me by your words you are quite right to endeavour to gain the blessing and gratitude of such as are poor and in misery is almost equal to being loved even as i would wish to be nay it is even superior in its purity and absence of self when i compare the existence i now venture to anticipate with the shameful and degraded lot i was preparing for myself my own reproaches become more bitter and severe i should indeed be grieved said rodolph smiling were that to be the case since all my desire is to make you forget the past and to prove to you that there are various modes of recreating and distracting our minds the means of good and evil are very frequently nearly the same it is the end only which differs in a word if good is as attractive as amusing as evil why should we prefer the latter i am going to use a very commonplace and hackneyed simile why do many women take as lovers men not nearly as worthy of that distinction as their own husbands because the greatest charm of love consists in the difficulties which surround it for once deprived of the hopes the fears the anxieties difficulties mysteries and dangers and little or nothing would remain merely the lover stripped of all the prestige derivable from these causes and a very everyday object he would appear very much after the fashion of the individual who when asked by a friend why he did not marry his mistress replied why i was thinking of it but if i did where should i go to pass my evenings your picture is coloured after nature my lord said madame d'harville smiling well then if i can find the means of enabling you to experience the fears the anxieties the excitement which seem to have such charms for you if i can render useful your natural love for mystery and romance your inclination for dissimulation and artifice you see my bad opinion of your sex will peep out in spite of me added rodolph gaily shall i not change into fine and generous qualities instincts which otherwise are mere ungovernable and unmanageable impulses excellent if well employed most fatal if directed badly now then what do you say shall we get up all manner of benevolent plots and charitable dissipations we will have our rendezvous our correspondence our secrets and above all we will carefully conceal all our doings from the marquis for your visit of to-day to the morels has in all probability excited his suspicions there you see it only requires your consent to commence a regular intrigue i accept with joy and gratitude the mysterious associations you propose my lord said clemence and by way of beginning our romance i will return to-morrow to visit those poor creatures to whom unfortunately this morning i could only utter a few words of consolation for taking advantage of my terror and alarm the purse you so thoughtfully supplied me with was stolen from me by a lame boy as i ascended the stairs ah my lord added clemence 
and her countenance lost the expression of gentle gaiety by which a few minutes before it was animated if you only knew what misery what a picture of wretchedness no oh no i never could have believed so horrid a scene or that such want existed and yet i bewail my condition and complain of my severe destiny rodolph wishing to conceal from madame d'harville how deeply he was touched at this application of the woes of others as teaching patience and resignation yet fully recognizing in the meek and subdued spirit the fine and noble qualities of her mind said gaily with your permission i shall accept the morels from your jurisdiction you shall resign them to my care and above all things promise me not again to enter that miserable place for to tell you the truth i live there you my lord what an idea nay but you really must believe me when i say i live there for it is actually true i confess mine is somewhat a humble lodging a mere matter of eight pounds a year in addition to which i pay the large and liberal sum of six francs a month to the porteress madame pipelet that ugly old woman you saw but to make up for all this i have as my next neighbour mademoiselle rigolette the prettiest grisette in the quartier du temple and you must allow that for a merchant's clerk with a salary of only seventy-two pounds a year i pass as a clerk such a domicile is well suited to my means your unhoped-for presence in that fatal house proves to me that you are speaking seriously my lord some generous action leads you there no doubt but what good action do you reserve for me what part do you propose for me to sustain that of an angel of consolation and pray excuse and allow me the word a very demon of cunning and manoeuvres for there are some wounds so painful as well as delicate that the hand of a woman only can watch over and heal them there are also unfortunate beings so proud so reserved and so hidden from observation that it requires uncommon penetration to discover them and an irresistible charm to win their confidence and when shall i have an opportunity of displaying the penetration and skill for which you give me credit asked madame d'harville impatiently soon i hope you will have to make a conquest worthy of you but to succeed you must employ all your most ingenious resources and when my lord will you confide this great secret to me let me see you perceive we have already got as far as arranging our rendezvous could you do me the favour to grant me an audience in four days time dear me so long first said clemence innocently but what would become of the mystery of the affair and all the strict forms and appearances necessary to be kept up if we were to meet sooner just imagine if our partnership were suspected people would be on their guard and we should seldom achieve our purpose i may very probably have to write to you who was that aged female who brought me your note an old servant of my mother's the very personification of prudence and discretion i will then address my letters under cover to her and she will deliver them into your hands if you are kind enough to return any answer address to m rodolphe rue plumet and that your maid put your letters in the post i will do that myself my lord when taking my usual morning's walk do you often walk out alone in fine weather nearly every day that's right it is a custom all young women should observe from the very earliest period of their marriage either from a good or an improper provision against future evil the habit once established it becomes what the lawyers style a precedent and in subsequent days these habitual promenades excite no dangerous interpretations if i had been a woman and between ourselves i fear i should have been very charitable but equally flighty the very day after my marriage i should in all possible innocence have taken the most mysterious steps and with perfect simplicity have involved myself in all manner of suspicious and compromising proceedings for the purpose of establishing the precedent i spoke of in order to be at liberty either to visit my poor pensioners or to meet my lover but that would be downright perfidy to one's husband would it not my lord said madame d'harville smiling fortunately for you madame you have never been driven to the necessity of admitting the utility of such provisionary measures madame d'harville's smile left her lips she cast down her eyes and blushing deeply said in a low and sad voice this is not generous my lord at first rodolphe regarded the marquise with astonishment then added i understand you madame 
but once for all let us weigh well your position as regards m charles robert i will just imagine that one of your acquaintances may one day have pointed out to you one of those pitiable looking mendicants who roll their eyes most sentimentally and play on the clarinet with desperate energy to awaken the sympathy of the passers-by that is really and truly a genuine case of distress observes your friend that interesting musician has at least seven children and a wife deaf dumb blind etc ah poor fellow you reply charitably aiding him with your purse and so each time you meet this case of genuine distress the clarinet player the moment he discerns you from afar fixes his imploring eyes upon you while the most touching strains of his instrument are directed to touch your charitable sympathies and that too so successfully that again your purse opens at this fresh appeal one day more than usually disposed to pity this very unfortunate object by the importunities of the friend who first pointed him out to you and who is most wickedly abusing your generous heart you resolve to visit this case of genuine distress as your false friend terms it and to behold the poor object of your solicitude in the midst of his misery well you go but lo the grief-stricken musician has vanished and in his place you find a lively rollicking fellow enjoying himself over some of the good things of this world and mirthfully carolling forth the last new alehouse catch then disgust succeeds to pity for you have bestowed your sympathy and charity alike upon an impostor neither more nor less is it not so madame d'harville could not restrain a smile at this singular apologue she however soon checked it as she added however grateful i may feel for this mode of justifying my great imprudence my lord i can but confess i dare not avail myself of so favourable a pretext as that of a mistaken charity yet after all yours was an error based upon motives of noble and generous pity for the wounded feelings of one you believed a genuine object for commiseration fortunately there are so many ways left you of atoning for one indiscretion that your regret need be but small shall i not have the pleasure of seeing m d'harville this evening no my lord the scene of this morning has so much affected him that he is ill said the marquise in a low tremulous tone ah replied rodolphe sadly i understand come courage you were saying that it required a name a motive a means of directing your thoughts permit me to hope that all this will be accomplished by following out the plan i have proposed your heart will be then so filled with the delightful recollection of all the happiness you have caused and all the good you have effected that in all probability you will find no room for resentment against your husband in place of angry feelings you will regard him with the same sorrowing pity you look on your dear child and as for the interesting little creature herself now you have confided to me the cause of her delicate health i almost think myself warranted in bidding you yet to entertain hopes of overcoming the fearful complaint which has hitherto affected her tender frame oh my lord exclaimed clemence clasping her hands with eagerness can it be possible how in what manner can my child be saved i have as physician to myself and household a man almost unknown though possessed of a first-rate science great part of his life was passed in america and i remember his speaking to me of some marvellous cures performed by him on slaves attacked by this distressing complaint and do you really think my lord nay you must not allow yourself to dwell too confidently upon success the disappointment would be so very severe only do not let us wholly despair clemence d'harville cast a hasty glance of unutterable gratitude over the noble features of rodolph the firm unflinching friend who reconciled her to herself with so much good sense intelligence and delicacy of feeling then she asked herself how for one instant she could ever have been interested in the fate of such a being as m charles robert the very idea was hateful to her what do i not owe you my lord cried she in a voice of thrilling emotion you console me for the past you open to me a glimpse of hope for my child and you place before me a plan of future occupation which shall afford me both consolation and the delight of doing my duty ah was i not right when i said that if you would come here to-night you would finish the day as you had begun it by performing a good action and pray madame do not omit to add an action after my own heart 
where all is pleasure and unmixed enjoyment in its performance and now adieu said rodolph rising as the clock struck half past eleven adieu my lord and pray do not forget to send me news ere long of those poor people in the rue du temple i will see them to-morrow for unfortunately i knew not of that little limping rascal having stolen your purse and i fear that the unhappy creatures are in the most deplorable want have the kindness to bear in mind that in the course of four days i shall come to explain to you the nature of the part you will be required to undertake one thing i must prepare you for and that is the probability of its being requisite for you to assume a disguise on the occasion a disguise oh how charming what sort of one my lord i cannot tell you at present i will leave the choice to you all that is requisite said the prince on his return home to save this excellent woman from the perils of another attachment is to fill her mind with generous thoughts and since an invincible repugnance separates her from her husband to employ her love for the romantic in such charitable actions as shall require being enshrouded in mystery end of chapter eleven part four read by celine major chapter twelve part one of the mysteries of paris volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain the mysteries of paris by eugene sue chapter twelve part one misery the reader has probably not forgotten that the garret in the rue du temple was occupied by an unfortunate family the father of whom was a working lapidary named morel we shall now endeavour to describe the wretched abode of morel and his children it was six o'clock in the morning a deep silence dwelt around the streets were still deserted for the snow fell fast and the cold biting wind froze as it blew a miserable candle stuck upon a small block of wood and supported by two slips of the same material scarcely penetrated with its yellow flickering light the misty darkness of the garret a narrow low-built place two-thirds of which were formed by the sloping roof which communicated by a sharp angle with the wretched flooring and freely exposed the moss-covered tiles of the outer roof walls covered with plaster blackened by time and split into countless crevices displayed the rotten worm-eaten lass which formed the frail division from other chambers while in one corner of this deplorable habitation a door off the hinges opened upon a narrow staircase the ground of a nameless colour but foul fetid and slippery was partly strewed with bits of dirty straw old rags and bones the residue of that unwholesome and vitiated food sold by the dealers in condemned meat and frequently bought by starving wretches for the purpose of gnawing the few cartilages that may adhere note four it is no uncommon thing to meet in densely crowded parts of paris with persons who openly sell the flesh of animals born dead as well as of others who have died of disease etc so wretched a condition either arises from improvidence and vice or from unavoidable misery misery so great so overwhelming and paralyzing as to enfeeble every energy and to render the unhappy object of it too hopeless too despairing even to attempt to extricate himself from the squalor of his utter destitution and he crouches in his dirt and desolation like an animal in its den during the day morel's garret was lighted by a species of long narrow skylight formed in the descending roof framed and glazed and made to open and shut by means of a pulley and string but at the hour which we are describing a heavy fall of snow encumbered the window and effectually prevented its affording any light the candle placed on morel's working-table which stood in the centre of the chamber diffused a kind of halo of pale sickly beams which gradually diminishing was at last lost in the dim shadow which overspread the place in whose murky duskiness might be seen the faint outline of several white-looking masses on the work-table which was merely a heavy and roughly cut wooden block of unpolished oak covered with grease and soot lay loosely scattered about a handful of rubies and diamonds of more than ordinary size and brilliancy while as the mean rays of the small candle were reflected on them they glittered and sparkled like so many coruscating fires morel was a worker of real stones and not false ones as he had given out and was universally believed in the rue du temple thanks to this innocent deception the costly jewels entrusted to him were merely supposed to be so many pieces of glass too valueless to tempt the cupidity of any one 
such riches confided to the care of one as poor and miserably destitute as morel will render any reference to the honesty of his character quite unnecessary seated on a high stool and wholly overcome by fatigue cold and weariness after a long winter's night passed in unceasing labour the poor lapidary had fallen asleep on his block with his head upon his half-frozen arms and his forehead resting against a small grindstone placed horizontally on the table and generally put in motion by a little hand-wheel while a fine steel saw and various other tools belonging to his trade were lying beside him the man himself of whom nothing but the skull surrounded by a fringe of grey hairs was visible was dressed in a shabby fustian jacket without any species of linen or garment underneath it and an old pair of cloth trousers while his worn-out slippers scarcely concealed the blue cold feet they partially covered from resting solely on the damp shiny floor and so bitter so freezing was the sharp winter wind which freely entered into this scarcely human dwelling that spite of the weariness and exhaustion of the overworked artisan his frame shuddered and shivered with involuntary frequency the length of the wick of the unsnuffed candle bespoke the length of time even this uneasy slumber must have lasted and no sound save his troubled and irregular breathing broke the death-like silence that prevailed for alas the other occupants of this mean abode were not so fortunate as to be able to forget their sufferings in sleep yet this narrow pent-up unwholesome spot contained no less than seven other persons five children the youngest of whom was four years of age the eldest twelve a sick and declining wife with an aged grandmother the parent of morel's wife now in her eightieth year and an idiot the cold must have been intense indeed when the natural warmth of so many persons so closely packed together in so small a place could not in any way affect the freezing atmosphere it was evident therefore to speak scientifically that but little caloric was given out by the poor weak emaciated shivering creatures all suffering and almost expiring with cold and hunger from the puny infant to the idiotic old grandmother with the exception of the father of the family who had temporarily yielded to the aching of his heavy eyelids no other creature slept no other because cold starvation and sickness will not allow so sweet an enjoyment as the closing the eyes in peaceful rest little does the world believe how rarely comes that sound healthful and refreshing slumber to the poor man's pillow which at once invigorates the mind and body and sends the willing labourer back to his toil refreshed and recruited by the blessing of a beneficent creator to taste of nature's sweet refreshing balmy sleep sickness sorrow poverty and mental disquietude must not share the humble palate in contrasting the deep misery of the poor artisan with whose woes we are now occupying the reader with the immense value of the jewellery confided to him we are struck by one of those comparisons which afflict while they elevate the mind while the distracting spectacle of his family's want and wretchedness embracing a wide field from cold and hunger to drivelling idiocy constantly before his eyes this man in the pursuance of his daily labour is compelled to touch and handle and gaze upon bright and sparkling gems the smallest of which would be a mine of wealth to him and save those dearest to him from sufferings and privations which wring his very heart would snatch them from the slow and lingering death which is consuming them before his eyes yet amid all these trials and temptations the artisan remains firmly truly and unflinchingly honest and would no more appropriate one of the glittering stones entrusted to him than he would satisfy his hunger at the expense of his starving babes doubtless the man but performed his duty to his employer his simple duty but because it is enjoined to all to be honest and faithful in that which is committed to them does that render the action itself less noble magnanimous or praiseworthy is not this unfortunate artisan so courageously so bravely upright and honest while entrusted with the property of another the type and model of an immense class of working people who doomed to a life of continual poverty and privation see with calm patient looks thousands of their brethren rolling in splendour and abounding in riches yet they toil on resigned and unenvying but still industrially striving for bread their hardest efforts cannot always procure and is there not something consolatory as well as gratifying to our feelings to consider that there is neither force nor terror but good natural sense and a right mind which alone restrain this formidable ocean this heaving mass whose bounds once broken a moral inundation would ensue 
in which society itself would be swallowed up shall we then refuse to co-operate with all the powers of our mind and body with those generous and enlightened spirits who ask but a little sunshine for so much misfortune courage and resignation let us now return to the alas too true specimen of distressing want we shall endeavour to describe in all its fearful and startling reality the lapidary possessed only a thin mattress and a portion of a blanket appropriated to the old grandmother who in her stupid and ferocious selfishness would not allow any person to share them with her in the beginning of the winter she had become quite violent and had even attempted to strangle the youngest child who had been put to sleep with her this poor infant was a sickly little creature of about four years old now far gone in consumption and who found it too cold inside the mattress where she slept with her brothers and sisters hereafter we shall explain this mode of sleeping so frequently employed by the very poor in comparison with whom the very animals are treated luxuriously for their litter is changed such was the picture presented in the humble garret of the poor lapidary when the eye was enabled to pierce the glooming penumbra caused by the flickering rays of the candle by the side of the partition wall not less damp and cracked than the others was placed on the floor the mattress on which the idiot grandmother reposed as she could not bear anything on her head her white hair was cut very short and revealed the shape of her head and flat forehead while her shaggy grey eyebrows shaded the deep orbits from which glared a wild savage yet crafty look her pale hollow wrinkled cheeks hung upon the bones of the face and the sharp angles of her jaws lying upon her side and almost doubled up her chin nearly touching her knees she lay shivering with cold beneath the grey rug too small to cover her all over and which as she drew it over her shoulders exposed her thin emaciated legs as well as the wretched old petticoat in which she was clad an odour most fetid and repulsive issued from this bed at a little distance from the mattress of the grandmother and still extending along the side of the wall was placed the paillasse which served as a sleeping place for the five children who were accommodated after the following manner an opening was made at each side of the cloth which covered the straw and the children were inserted into this bed or rather foul and noisome dunghill the outer case serving both for sheet and counterpane two little girls one of whom was extremely ill shivered on one side and three young boys on the other all going to bed without undressing if indeed the miserable rags they wore could be termed clothes masses of thick dry light hair tangled ragged and uncombed left uncut because their poor mother fancied it helped to keep them warm half covered their pale thin pinched features one of the boys drew with his cold benumbed fingers the covering over their straw bed up to his chin in order to defend himself from the cold while another fearful of exposing his hands to the influence of the frost tried to grasp the bed covering with his teeth which rattled and shook in his head while the third strove to huddle up to his brothers in the hopes of gaining a little warmth the youngest of the two girls fatally attacked by consumption leaned her poor little face which already bore the hue of death languidly against the chilly bosom of her sister a girl just one year older who vainly sought by pressing her in her arms to impart comfort and ease to the little sufferer over whom she watched with the anxious solicitude of a parent on another paillasse also placed on the ground at the foot of that of the children the wife of the artisan was extended groaning in helpless exhaustion from the effects of a slow fever and an internal complaint which had not permitted her to quit her bed for several months madeleine morel was in her thirty-sixth year a blue cotton handkerchief tied round her low forehead made the bilious pallor of her countenance and sharp emaciated features still more conspicuous a dark halo encircled her hollow sunken eyes while her lips were split and bleeding from the effects of the fever which consumed her her dejected grief-worn physiognomy and small insignificant features indicated one of those gentle but weak natures without resource or energy which unable to struggle with misfortunes yield at once and know no remedy but vain and ceaseless lamentations and regrets weak spiritless and of limited capacity she had remained honest because her husband was so had she been left to herself it is probable that ignorance and misfortune might have depraved her mind and driven her to any lengths she loved her husband and her children but she had neither the courage nor resolution to restrain giving vent to loud and open complaints respecting their mutual misery and frequently was the lapidary 
whose unflinching labour alone maintained the family obliged to quit his work to console and pacify the poor valetudinarian over and above an old ragged sheet of coarse brown cloth which partially covered his wife morel had in order to impart a little warmth laid a few old clothes so worn out and patched and pieced that the pawnbroker had refused to have anything to do with them a stove a saucepan a damaged earthen stewpan two or three cracked cups scattered about on the floor a bucket a board to wash on and a large stone pitcher placed beneath the angle of the roof near the broken door which the wind kept continually blowing to and fro completed the whole of the family possessions this picture of squalid misery and desolation was lighted up by the candle whose flame agitated by the cold north-easterly wind which found its way through the tiles on the roof sometimes imparted a pale unearthly light on the wretched scene and then playing on the heaps of diamonds and rubies lying beside the sleeping artisan caused a thousand scintillating sparks to spring forth and dazzle the eye with their prismatic rays of brightness although the profoundest silence reigned around seven out of the eight unfortunate dwellers in this attic were awake and each from the grandmother to the youngest child watched the sleeping lapidary with intense emotion as their only hope their only resource and in their childlike selfishness they murmured at seeing him thus inactive and relinquishing that labour which they well knew was all they had to depend on but with different feelings of regret and uneasiness did the lookers-on observe the slumber of the toil-worn man the mother trembled for her children's meal the children thought but of themselves while the idiot neither thought of nor cared for any one all at once she sat upright in her wretched bed crossed her long bony arms yellow and dry as boxwood on her shrivelled bosom and kept watching the candle with twinkling eyes then rising slowly and stealthily she crept along trailing after her her old ragged coverlet which clung around her as though it had been her winding-sheet she was above the middle height and her hair being so closely shaven made her head appear disproportionately small a sort of spasmodic movement kept up a constant trembling in her thick pendulous underlip while her whole countenance offered the hideous model of ferocious stupidity slowly and cautiously the idiot approached the lapidary's work-table like a child about to commit some forbidden act when she reached the candle she held her two trembling hands over the flame and such was their skeleton-like condition that the flickering light shone through them imparting a pale livid hue to her features from her palette madeleine morel watched every movement of the old woman who still warming herself over the candle stooped her head and with a silly kind of delight watched the sparkling of the diamonds and rubies which lay glittering on the table wholly absorbed in the wondrous contemplation of such bright and beautiful things the idiot allowed her hands to fall into the flame of the candle nor did she seem to recollect where they were till the sense of burning recalled her attention when she manifested her pain and anger by a harsh screaming cry at this sound morel started and quickly raised his head he was about forty years of age with an open intelligent and mild expression of countenance but yet wearing the sad dejected look of one who had been the sport of misery and misfortune till they had planted furrows in his cheeks and crushed and broken his spirit a grey beard of many weeks growth covered the lower part of his face which was deeply marked by the smallpox premature wrinkles furrowed his already bald forehead while his red and inflamed eyelids showed the overtaxed and sleepless days and nights of toil he so courageously endured a circumstance but too common with such of the working class are doomed by their occupation to remain nearly all day in one position had warped his figure and acting upon a naturally feeble constitution had produced a contraction of his whole frame continually obliged to stoop over his work-table and to lean to the left in order to keep his grindstone going the lapidary in a manner petrified ossified in the attitude he was frequently obliged to preserve from twelve to fifteen hours a day had acquired an habitual stoop of the shoulders and was completely drawn on one side so his left arm incessantly exercised by the difficult management of the grindstone had acquired a considerable muscular development whilst the right arm always inert and leaning on the table the better to present the faces of the diamonds to the action of the grindstone had wasted to the most extreme attenuation his wasted limbs almost paralyzed by complete want of exercise could scarcely support the weary worn-out body as though all strength substance and vitality had concentrated themselves in the only part called into play when toiling for the substance of with himself eight human creatures 
and often would poor morel touchingly observe it is not for myself that i care to eat but to give strength to the arm which turns the mill awaking with a sudden start the lapidary found himself directly opposite to the poor idiot what ails you what is the matter mother said morel and then added in a lower tone for fear of awaking the family whom he hoped and believed were asleep go back to bed mother madeleine and the children are asleep no father cried the eldest of the little girls i am awake i am trying to warm poor little adele and i am too hungry to go to sleep added one of the boys it was not my turn to-night to have supper with mademoiselle rigolette poor things said morel sorrowfully i thought you were asleep at least i was afraid of awaking you morel said the wife or i should have begged of you to give me a drink of water i am devoured with thirst my feverish fit has come on again i will directly said the lapidary only let me first get mother back to bed come come what are you meddling with those stones for let them alone i say cried he to the old woman whose whole attention seemed riveted upon a splendid ruby the bright scintillations of which had so charmed the poor idiot that she was trying by every possible means to gain possession of it there's a pretty thing there there replied the woman pointing with vehement gestures to the prize she so ardently coveted i shall be angry in a few minutes exclaimed morel speaking in a loud voice to terrify his mother-in-law into submission and gently pushing back the hand she advanced to seize her desired treasure oh morel morel murmured madeleine i am parching dying with thirst how can you be so cruel as to refuse me a little water but how can i at present i must not allow mother to meddle with these stones perhaps to lose me a diamond as she did a year ago and god alone knows the wretchedness and misery it cost us i may still occasion us ah oh, that unfortunate loss of the diamond what have we not suffered by it as the poor lapidary uttered these words he passed his hand over his aching brow with a desponding air and said to one of the children felix give your mother something to drink you are awake and can attend to her no no exclaimed madeline he will take cold i will wait oh mother said the boy rising never mind me i shall be quite as warm up as i am in this paillasse come will you let the things alone cried morel in a threatening tone to the idiot woman who kept bending over the precious stones and trying to seize them spite of all his efforts to move her from the table mother called out felix what shall i do the water in the pitcher is frozen quite hard then break the ice murmured madeleine it is so thick i can't answered the boy morel exclaimed madeleine in a querulous and impatient tone since there is nothing but water for me to drink let me at least have a draught of that you are letting me die with thirst god of heaven grant me patience cried the unfortunate man how can i leave your mother to lose and destroy these stones pray let me manage her first but the lapidary found it no easy matter to get rid of the idiot who beginning to feel irritated at the constant opposition she met with gave utterance to her displeasure in a sort of hideous growl call her wife said morel she will attend to you sometimes mother mother called madeleine go to bed and be good and then you shall have some of that nice coffee you are so fond of i want that and that there there replied the idiot making a desperate effort this time to possess herself of a heap of rubies she particularly coveted morel firmly but gently repulsed her all in vain with pertinacious obstinacy the old woman kept struggling to break from his grasp and snatch the bright gems on which she kept her eyes fixed with eager fondness you will never manage her said madeleine unless you frighten her with the whip there is no other means of making her quiet i am afraid not returned morel but though she has no sense it yet goes to my heart to be obliged to threaten an old woman like her with the whip then addressing the old woman who was trying to bite him and whom he was holding back with one hand he said in a loud and terrible voice take care you'll have the whip on your shoulders if you don't make haste to bed this very instant these menaces were equally vain with his former efforts to subdue her morel then took a whip which lay beside his work-table 
and cracking it violently said get to bed with you directly get to bed as the loud noise of the whip saluted the ear of the idiot she hurried away from the lapidary's work-table then suddenly turning around she uttered low grumbling sounds between her clenched teeth while she surveyed her son-in-law with looks of the deepest hatred to bed to bed i say continued he still advancing and feigning to raise his whip with the intention of striking while the idiot holding her fist towards her son-in-law retreated backwards to her wretched couch the lapidary anxious to terminate this painful scene that he might be at liberty to attend to his sick wife kept still advancing towards the idiot woman brandishing and cracking his whip though without allowing it to touch the unhappy creature repeatedly exclaiming to bed to bed directly do you hear the old woman now thoroughly conquered and fully believing in the reality of the threats held out began to howl most hideously and crawling into her bed like a dog to his kennel she kept up a continued series of cries screams and yells while the frightened children believing their poor old grandmother had actually been beaten began crying piteously exclaiming don't beat poor granny father pray don't flog granny end of chapter twelve part one read by celine major chapter twelve part two of the mysteries of paris volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain the mysteries of paris by eugene sue chapter twelve part two it is wholly impossible to describe the fearful effect of these nocturnal horrors in which were mingled in one turmoil of sounds the supplicating cries of the children the furious yellings of the idiot and the wailing complaints of the lapidary's sick wife to poor morel such scenes as this were but too frequent still upon the present occasion his patience and courage seemed utterly to forsake him and throwing down the whip upon his work-table he exclaimed in bitter despair oh what a life what a life is it my fault if my mother is an idiot asked madeleine weeping is it mine then replied morel all i ask for is peace and quiet enough to allow me to work myself to death for you all god knows i labour alike night and day yet i complain not and as long as my strength holds out i will exert myself to the utmost but it is quite impossible for me to attend to my business and be at once a keeper to a mad woman and a nurse to sick people and young children and heaven is unjust to put it upon me yes i say unjust it is too much misery to heap on one man added morel in a tone bordering on distraction so saying the heart-broken lapidary threw himself on his stool and covered his face with his hands can i help the people at the hospital having refused to receive my mother because she was not raving mad asked madeleine in a low peevish and complaining voice what can i do to alter it what is the use of your grumbling to me about my mother and if you fret ever so much about what neither you nor i can alter what good will that do none at all rejoined the artisan hastily brushing the large bitter drops despair had driven to his eyes none whatever you are right but when everything goes against you it is difficult to know what to do or say gracious father cried madeline what an agony of thirst i am enduring my lips are parched with the fever which is consuming me and yet i shiver as though death were on me wait one instant and i will give you something to drink so saying morel took the pitcher which stood beneath the roof and after having with difficulty broken the ice which covered the water he filled a cup with the frozen liquid and brought it to the bedside of his wife who stretched forth her impatient hands to receive it but after a moment's reflection he said no no i must not let you have it cold as this in your present state of fever it would be dangerous so much the better if it be dangerous quick quick give it me cried madeline with bitterness it will the sooner end my misery and free you from such an encumbrance as i am then you will only have to look after mad folks and young children there will be no sick nurse to take up your time why do you say such hard words to me madeline asked morel mournfully you know i do not deserve them 
pray do not add to my vexations for i have scarcely strength or reason enough left to go on with my work my head feels as though something were amiss with it and i fear much my brain will give way and then what would become of you all tis for you i speak were there only myself i should trouble very little about to-morrow thank heaven the river flows for every one poor morel said madeline deeply affected i was very wrong to speak so angrily to you and to say i knew you would be glad to get rid of me pray forgive me for indeed i did not mean any harm for after all what use am i either to you or the children for the last sixteen months i have kept my bed gracious god what i do suffer with thirst for pity's sake husband give me something to moisten my burning lips you shall have it directly i was trying to warm the cup between my hands how good you are and yet i could say such wicked things to you my poor wife you are ill and in pain and that makes you impatient say anything you like to me but pray never tell me again i wish to get rid of you but what good am i to any one what good are our children none whatever on the contrary they heap more toil upon you than you can bear true yet you see that my love for them and you has endued me with strength and resolution to work frequently twenty-four hours out of the twenty-four till my body is bent and deformed by such incessant labour do you believe for one instant that i would thus toil and struggle on my own account oh no life has no such charms for me and if i were the only sufferer i would quickly put an end to it and so would i said madeline god knows but for the children i should have said to you long ago morel we have had more than enough to weary us of our lives there is nothing left but to finish our misery by the help of a pan of charcoal but then i recollected the poor dear helpless children and my heart would not let me leave them alone and unprotected to starve by themselves well then you see wife that the children are after all of real good to us since they prevent us giving way to despair and serve as a motive for exerting ourselves replied morel with ready ingenuity yet perfect simplicity of tone and manner now then take your drink but only swallow a little at a time for it is very cold still oh thank you morel cried madeline snatching the cup and drinking it eagerly enough enough no more you shall not have any more just now madeline gracious heaven exclaimed madeline giving back the cup how cold it seems now i have swallowed it it has brought back those dreadful shiverings alas ejaculated morel i told you so ah oh, now you are quite ill again i have not strength even to tremble i seem as though i were covered over with ice morel took off his jacket and laid it over his wife's feet remaining quite naked down to his waist the unhappy man did not possess a shirt but you will be frozen to death morel never mind me if i find it cold by and by i will put my jacket on for a few minutes poor fellow sighed madeline ah as you say heaven is not just what have we done to be so wretched while so many others every one has their troubles some more some less the great as well as the small yes but great people know nothing of the gnawings of hunger or the bitter pinching of the cold why when i look on those diamonds and remember that the smallest among them would place us and the poor children in ease and comfort my heart sickens and i ask myself why it is some should have so much and others nothing and what good are these diamonds after all to their owners why if we were to go to the question of what half the luxuries of life are really good for we might go a great way for instance what is the good of that grand gentleman madame pipelet calls the commandant having engaged and furnished the first floor of this house when he seldom answers it what use is it his having their good beds and warm covering to them since he never sleeps in them very true 
there is more furniture lying idle there than would supply two or three poor families like ours and then madame pipelet lights a fire every day to preserve the things from the damp only think of so much comfortable warmth being lost while we and the children are almost frozen to death but then you will say we are not articles of value no indeed we are not oh these rich folks what hard hearts they have no harder than other people's madeline but then you see they do not know what misery or want are they are born rich and happy they live and die so how then do you expect they can ever think such poor distressed beings exist in a world which to them is all happiness no i tell you they have no idea of such things as fellow-creatures toiling beyond their strength for food and perishing at last with hunger how is it possible for them to imagine privation like ours the greater their hunger the greater enjoyment of their abundant meal is the weather severe or the cold intense they call it a fine frost a healthful bracing season if they walk out they return to a glowing cheerful fire which the cold only makes them relish the more so that they can scarcely be expected to sympathize with such as are said to suffer from cold and hunger when those two things rather add to than diminish their pleasure ah poor folks are better than rich since they can feel for each other and are always ready and willing to assist each other as much as lies in their power look at that kind good mademoiselle rigolette who has so often sat up all night either with me or the children during our illness why last night she took jerome and pierre into her room to share her supper and it was not much either she had for herself only a cup of milk and some bread at her age all young people have good appetites and she must have deprived herself to give to the children poor girl she is indeed most kind and why is she so because she knows what poverty is as i said to you just now if the rich only knew and then that nice-looking lady who came seeming so frightened all the while to ask us if we wanted anything well now she knows that we do want everything will she ever come again think you i dare say she will for spite of her uneasy and terrified looks she seemed very good and kind oh yes if a person be but rich they are always right in your opinion one might almost suppose that rich folks are made of different materials to poor creatures like us stop wife said morel gently you are getting on too fast i did not say that on the contrary i agree that rich people have as many faults as poor ones all i mean is that unfortunately they are not aware of the wretchedness of one half of the world agents in plenty are employed to hunt out poor wretches who have committed any crime but there are no paid agents to find out half-starving families and honest artisans worn out with toil and privations who driven to the last extremity of distress are for want of a little timely succour led into sore temptation it is quite right to punish evil-doers it would perhaps be better still to prevent ill deeds a man may have striven hard to remain honest for fifty years but want misery and utter destitution put bad thoughts in his head and one rascal more is let loose on the world whilst there are many who if they had but known of his distressed condition however it is no use talking of that the world is as it is i am poor and wretched and therefore i speak as i do were i rich my talk would be a fete and happy days and worldly engagements and how do you find yourself now wife much the same i seem to have lost all feeling in my limbs but how you shiver here take your jacket and pray put it on blow out that candle which is burning uselessly see it is nearly day and true enough a faint glimmering light began to struggle through the snow with which the skylight was encumbered and cast a dismal ray on the interior of this deplorable human abode rendering its squalidness still more apparent the shade of night had at least concealed a part of its horrors i shall wait now for the daylight before i go back to work said the lapidary seating himself beside his wife's paillesse and leaning his forehead upon his two hands after a short interval of silence madeleine said 
when is madame mathieu to come for the stones you are at work upon this morning i have only the side of one false diamond to polish a false diamond how is that you who only make up real stones whatever the people in the house may believe don't you know but i forgot you were asleep the other day when madame mathieu came about them well then she brought me ten false diamonds rhine crystals to cut exactly to the same size and form as the like number of real diamonds she also brought there those are them mixed with the rubies on my table i think i never saw more splendid stones or of purer water than those ten diamonds which must at least be worth sixty thousand francs and why did she wish them imitated because a great lady to whom they belonged a duchess i think she said had given directions to m baudouin the jeweller to dispose of her set of diamonds and to make her one of false stones to replace it madame mathieu who matches stones for m baudouin explained this to me when she gave me the real diamonds in order that i might be quite sure to cut the false ones to precisely the same size and form madame mathieu gave a similar job to four other lapidaries for there are from forty to fifty stones to cut and i could not do them all as they were required by this morning because m baudouin must have time to set the false gems madame mathieu says that grand ladies very frequently unknown to anybody but the jeweller sell their valuable diamonds and replace them with rhenish crystals why don't you see the mock stones look every bit as well as the real stones yet great ladies who only use such things as ornaments would never think of sacrificing one of their diamonds to relieve the distress of such unfortunate beings as we are come come wife be more reasonable than this sorrow makes you unjust who do you think knows that such people as morel and his family are in existence still less that they are in want oh what a man you are morel i really believe if any one were to cut you in pieces that while they were doing it you would try to say thank you morel compassionately shrugged his shoulders and how much will madame mathieu owe you this morning asked madeleine nothing because you know i have already had an advance of one hundred twenty francs nothing why our last sou went the day before yesterday we have not a single farthing belonging to us alas no cried morel with a dejected air well then what are we to do i know not the baker refuses to let us have anything more on credit will he no and i was obliged yesterday to beg madame pipelet to lend me part of a loaf can we borrow anything more of mother burette she has already every article belonging to us in pledge what have we to offer her to lend more money on our children asked morel with a smile of bitterness but yourself my mother and all the children had but part of a loaf among you all yesterday you cannot go on this way you will be starved to death it is all your fault that we are not on the books of the charitable institution this year they will not admit any persons without they possess furniture or some such property and you know we have nothing in the world we are looked upon as though we lived in furnished apartments and consequently ineligible just the same if we try to get into any asylum the children are required to have at least a blouse while our poor things have only rags then as to the charitable societies one must go backwards and forwards twenty times before we should obtain relief and then what would it be why a loaf once a month and half a pound of meat once a fortnight note five i should lose more time than it would be worth note five such is the ordinary allowance made at charitable societies in consequence of the vast number of applicants for relief but still what are we to do perhaps the lady who came yesterday will not forget us perhaps not but don't you think madame mathieu would lend us four or five francs just to keep us from starving you have worked for her upwards of ten years and surely she will not see an honest workman like you burdened with a large and sickly family perish for want of a little assistance like that i do not think it is in her power to aid us 
she did all in her power when she advanced me little by little one hundred twenty francs that is a large sum for her because she buys diamonds and has sometimes fifty thousand francs in her reticule she is not the much more rich for that if she gains one hundred francs a month she is well content for she has heavy expenses two nieces to bring up and five francs is as much to her as it would be to me there are times when one does not possess that sum you know and being already so deeply in her debt i could not ask her to take bread from her own mouth and that of her family to give it to me this comes of working for mere agents in jewellery instead of procuring employment from first-hand master jewellers they are sometimes less particular but you are such a poor easy creature you would almost let any one take the eyes out of your head it is all your fault that my fault exclaimed the unhappy man exasperated by this absurd reproach was it or was it not your mother who occasioned all our misfortunes by compelling me to make good the price of the diamond she lost but for that we should be beforehand with the world we should receive the amount of my daily earnings we should have the eleven hundred francs in our possession we were obliged to draw out of the savings bank to put to the thirteen hundred francs lent us by m jacques ferrand may every curse light on him and you still persist in not asking him to help you certainly he is so stingy that i dare say he would do nothing for you but then it is right to try you cannot know without you do try ask him to help me cried morel ask him i had rather be burnt before a slow fire hark ye madeline unless you wish to drive me mad mention that man's name no more to me as he uttered these words the usually mild resigned expression of the lapidary's countenance was exchanged for a look of gloomy energy while a slight suffusion coloured the ordinarily pale features of the agitated man as rising abruptly from the pallet beside which he had been sitting he began to pace the miserable apartment with hurried steps and spite of the deformed and attenuated appearance of poor morel his attitude and action bespoke the noblest purest indignation i am not ill-disposed towards any man cried he at length pausing of a sudden and never to my knowledge harmed a human being but i tell you when i think of this notary i wish him ah uh, i wish him as much wretchedness as he has caused me then pressing both hands to his forehead he murmured in a mournful tone just god what crime have i committed that a hard fate should deliver me and mine tied hand and foot into the power of such a hypocrite have his riches been given him only to worry harass and destroy those his bad passions lead him to persecute injure and corrupt that's right that's right said madeline go on abusing him you will have done yourself a great deal of good shall you not when he puts you in prison as he can do any day for that promissory note of thirteen hundred francs on which he obtained judgment against you he holds you fast as a bird at the end of a string i hate this notary as badly as you do but since we are so completely in his power why you should let him ruin and dishonour my child i suppose burst from the pale lips of the lapidary with violent and impatient energy for heaven's sake morel don't speak so loud the children are awake and will hear you pooh pooh returned morel with bitter irony it will serve as a fine example for our two little girls it will instruct them to expect that one of these days some villain or other like the notary may take a fancy to them perhaps the same man and then i suppose you would tell me as now to be careful how i offended him since he had me in his power you say if i displease him he can put me in prison now tell the truth you advise me then to leave my daughter at his mercy do you not and then passing from the extreme of rage at the idea of all the wickedness practised by the notary to tender recollections of his child the unhappy man burst into a sort of convulsive weeping mingled with deep and heavy sobs for his kindly nature could not long sustain the tone of sarcastic indignation he had assumed oh my children cried he with bitter grief my poor children my good my beautiful too beautiful louise 
tis from those rich gifts of nature all our troubles proceeded had you been less lovely that man would never have pressed his money upon me i am honest and hard-working and if the jeweller had given me time i should never have been under the obligation to the old monster of which he avails himself to seek to dishonour my child i should not then have left her a single hour within his power but i dare not remove her i dare not for am i not at his mercy o oh, want o oh, misery what insults do they not make us endure but what can you do asked madeline you know he threatens louise that if she quits him he will put you in prison directly oh yes he dares address her as though she were the very vilest of creatures well you must not mind that for she should leave the notary there is no doubt he would instantly throw you into prison and then what would become of me with these five helpless creatures and my mother suppose louise did earn twenty francs a month in another place do you think seven persons can live on that and so that we may live louise is to be disgraced and left to ruin you always make things out worse than they are it is true the notary makes offers of love to louise she has told us so repeatedly but then you know what a good girl she is she would never listen to him she is good indeed and so right-minded active and industrious when seeing how badly we were off in consequence of your long illness she insisted upon going to service that she might not be a burden to us did i not say what it cost me to part with her to think of my sweet louise being subjected to all the harshness and humiliation of a servant's life she who was naturally so proud that we used jokingly ah <laughs> we could joke then to call her the princess because she always said that by dint of care and cleanliness she would make our little home like a palace dear louise it would have been my greatest happiness to have kept her with me though i had worked all day and all night too and when i saw her blooming face with her bright eyes glancing at me as she sat beside my work-table my labour always seemed lightened and when she sung like a bird those little songs she knew i liked to hear i used to fancy myself the happiest father alive poor dear louise so hard-working yet always so gay and lively why she could even manage your mother and make her do whatever she wished but i defy any one to resist her sweet words or winning smile and how she watched over and waited upon you what pains she would take to try and divert you from thinking of what you suffered and how tenderly she looked after her little brothers and sisters finding time for everything oh with our louise all our joy and happiness all all left us don't go on so morel don't remind me of all these things or you will break my heart cried madeline weeping bitterly and then when i think that perhaps that old monster do you know when that idea flashes across my brain my senses seem disturbed and i have but one thought that of first killing him and then killing myself what would become of all of us if he were to do so besides i tell you again you make things worse than they really are i dare say the notary was only joking with louise he is such a pious man and goes so regularly to mass every sunday and only keeps company with priests folks say why many people think that he is safer to place money with than the bank itself well and what does all that prove merely that he is a rich hypocrite instead of a poor one i know well enough what a good girl louise is but then she loves us so tenderly that it breaks her heart to see the want and wretchedness we are in she knows well enough that if anything were to happen to me you would all perish with hunger and by threatening to put me into prison he might work on the dear child's mind like a villain as he is and persuade her on our account oh god my brain burns i feel as though i were going mad but morel if ever that were the case the notary would be sure to make her a great number of fine presents or money and i am sure she would not have kept them all to herself she would certainly have brought part to us silence woman let me hear no more such words escape your lips 
louise touched the wages of infamy my good my virtuous girl accept such foul gifts o oh, wife not for herself certainly but to bring to us perhaps she would madeline exclaimed morel excited almost to frenzy again i say let me not hear such language from your lips you make me shudder heaven only knows what you and the children also would become were i taken away if such are your principles why what harm did i say oh none then what makes you uneasy about louise the lapidary impatiently interrupted his wife by saying because i have noticed for the last three months that whenever louise comes to see us she seems embarrassed and even confused when i take her in my arms and embrace her as i have been used to do from her birth she blushes ah that is with delight at seeing you or from shame she seems sadder and more dejected too each visit she pays us because she finds our misery constantly increasing besides when i spoke to her concerning the notary she told me he had quite ceased his threats of putting you in prison but did she tell you the price she has paid to induce him to lay aside his threats she did not tell you that i dare say did she ah a father's eye is not to be deceived and her blushes and embarrassments when giving me her usual kiss make me dread i know not what why would it not be an atrocious thing to say to a poor girl whose bread depended on her employer's word either sacrifice your virtuous principles and become what i would have you or quit my house and if any one should inquire of me respecting the character you have with me i shall speak of you in such terms that no one will take you into their service well then how much worse is it to frighten a fond and affectionate child into surrendering her innocence by threatening to put her father into prison if she refused when the brute knows that upon the labour of that father a whole family depends surely the earth contains nothing more infamous more fiend-like than such conduct ah replied madeline and then only to think that with the value of one only one of those diamonds now lying on your table we might pay the notary all we owe him and so take louise out of his power and keep her at home with us don't you see husband what is the use of your repeating the same thing over and over again you might just as well tell me that if i were rich i should not be poor answered morel with sorrowful impatience for such was the innate and almost constitutional honesty of this man that it never once occurred to him that his weak-minded partner bowed down and irritated by long suffering and want could ever have conceived the idea of tempting him to a dishonourable appropriation of that which belonged to another with a heavy sigh the unfortunate man resigned himself to his hard fate thrice happy those parents who can retain their innocent children beneath the paternal roof and defend them from the thousand snares laid to entrap their unsuspecting youth but who is there to watch over the safety of the poor girl condemned at an early age to seek employment from home alas no one directly she is capable of adding her mite to the family earnings she leaves her dwelling at an early hour and repairs to the manufactory where she may happen to be engaged meanwhile both father and mother are too busily employed to have leisure to attend their daughter's comings or goings our time is our stock in trade cry they and bread is too dear to enable us to lay aside our work while we look after our children and then there is an outcry raised as to the quantity of depraved females constantly to be met with and of the impropriety of conduct among those of the lower orders wholly forgetting that the parents have neither the means of keeping them at home nor of watching over their morals when away from them thus mentally moralized morel then speaking aloud he added after all our greatest privation is when forced to quit our parents wives or children it is to the poor that family affection is most comforting and beneficial yet directly our children grow up and are capable of becoming our dearest companions we are forced to part with them at this moment some one knocked loudly at the door End of chapter twelve part two read by Celine Major
Chapter Thirteen, Part One of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mysteries of Paris by Eugène Sue. Chapter Thirteen, Part One: Judgment and Execution. The lapidary, much astonished, rose and opened the door. Two men entered the garret. One, tall, lanky, with an ill-favoured and pimply face, shaded by thick, grisly whiskers, held in his hand a thick cane loaded at the head he wore a battered hat and a long-tailed and bespattered green coat buttoned up close to his throat above the threadbare velvet collar was displayed his long neck red and bald like that of a vulture this man's name was malicorne the other was a shorter man with a look as low-lived and red fat puffed features dressed with a great effort at ridiculous splendour shiny buttons were in the folds of the front of his shirt whose cleanliness was most suspicious and a long chain of mosaic gold serpentined down a faded plaid waistcoat which was seen beneath his seedy chesterfield of a yellowish grey colour this gentleman's name was bourdin how poverty-stricken this hole smells said malicorne pausing on the threshold why it does not scent of lavender water confound it but we have a lowish customer to deal with responded bourdin with a gesture of disgust and contempt and then advanced towards the artisan who was looking at him with as much surprise as indignation through the door left a little ajar might be seen the villainous watchful and cunning face of the young scamp tortillard who having followed these strangers unknown to them was sneaking after spying and listening to them what do you want inquired the lapidary abruptly disgusted at the coarseness of these fellows jerome morel said bourdin i am he working lapidary yes you are quite sure quite sure but you are troublesome so tell me at once your business or leave the room really your politeness is remarkable much obliged i say malicorne said the man turning to his comrade there's not so much fat to cut at here as there was at that air viscount de saint remy's i believe you but when there is fat why the door's kept shut in your face as we found in the rue du chaillot the bird had hopped the twig and precious quick too while such vermin as these hold on to their cribs like a snail to his shell i believe you well the stone jug just suits such individuals the sufferer creditor must be a good fellow for it will cost him more than it's worth but that's his lookout if said morel angrily you were not drunk as you seem to be i should be angry with you leave this apartment instantly ha 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 he's a fine fellow with his elegant curve said bourdin making an insulting allusion to the contorted figure of the poor lapidary i say malicorne he has cheek enough to call this an apartment a hole in which i would not put my dog oh dear oh dear exclaimed madeleine who had been so frightened that she could not say a word before call for assistance perhaps they are rogues take care of your diamonds and seeing these two ill-looking strangers come closer to his working bench on which his precious stones were still lying morel fearful of some evil intentions ran towards the table and covered the jewels with his two hands tortillard still on the watch caught at madeleine's words observed the movement of the artisan and said to himself ha 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 so they said he was a lapidary of sham stones if they were mock he would not be afraid of being robbed this is a good thing to know so mother mathieu who comes here so often is a matcher of real stones after all and has real diamonds in her basket this is a good thing to know and i'll tell the chouette added bras rouge's brat if you do not leave this room i will call in the guard said morel the children alarmed at this scene began to cry and the idiotic mother sat up in her bed if any one has a right to call for the guard it is we you mr twistabout said bourdin and the guard would lend us a hand to carry you off to jail if you resist added malicorne we have not the magistrate with us it is true but if you have any wish for his company we'll find you one just out of bed hot and heavy bourdin will go and fetch him to prison me exclaimed morel struck with dismay yes to cliche to cliche repeated the artisan with an air of despair it seems a hardish pill said malicorne 
well then to the debtor's jail if you like that better said bourdin you what indeed why the notary ah oh, mon dieu and the workman pale as death fell on his stool unable to add another word we are bound bailiffs come to lay hold of you now are you fly morel it is the note of louise's master we are undone exclaimed madeleine in a tone of agony hear the judgment said malicorne taking from his dirty and crammed pocket-book a stamped writ after having skimmed over according to custom a part of this document in an unintelligible tone he distinctly articulated the last words which were unfortunately but too important to the artisan judgment finally given the tribunal condemns jerome morel to pay to pierre petitjean merchant note six by every available means even to the arrest of body the sum of thirteen hundred francs with interest from the day of protest and to pay all other and extra costs given and judged at paris thirteen september etc etc note six the cunning notary unable to prosecute in his own name had made the unfortunate morel give a blank acceptance and had filled up the note of hand with the name of a third party and louise louise cried morel almost distracted in his brain and apparently unheeding the long preamble which had just been read where is louise then for doubtless she has quitted the notary since he sends me to prison my child my louise what has become of you who the devil is louise asked bourdin let him alone replied malicorne brutally don't you see the respectable old twaddler is not right in his nonsense box then approaching morel he added i say my fine fellow right about file march on let us get out of here will you and have a little fresh air you stink enough to poison a cat in this here hole morel shrieked madeleine wildly don't go kill those wretches oh you coward not to knock them down what are you going to let them take you away are you going to abandon us all pray don't put yourself out of the way ma'am said bourdin with an ironical grin i've only just got to remark that if your good man lays his little finger on me why i'll make him remember it continued he swinging his loaded stick round and round entirely occupied with thoughts of louise morel scarcely heard a word of what was passing all at once an expression of bitter satisfaction passed over his countenance as he said louise has doubtless left the notary's house now i shall go to prison willingly then casting a troubled look around him he exclaimed but my wife her mother the children who will provide for them no one will trust me with stones to work at in prison for it will be supposed my bad conduct has sent me there does this hard-hearted notary wish the destruction of myself and all my family also once twice old chap said bourdin will you stop your gammon you are enough to bore a man to death come put on your things and let us be off good gentlemen kind gentlemen cried madeline from her sick-bed pray forgive what i said just now surely you will not be so cruel as to take my husband away what will become of me and my five poor children and my old mother who is an idiot there she lies you see her poor old creature huddled up on her mattress she is quite out of her senses my good gentleman she is indeed quite mad la what that old bald-headed thing a woman well hang me if that ain't enough to astonish a man i'll be hanged if it isn't then cried the other bailiff bursting into a hoarse laugh why i took it for something tied up in an old sack look her old head is shaved quite close it seems as though she had got a white skull-cap on go children and kneel down and beg of these good gentlemen not to take away your poor father our only support cried madeline anxious by a last effort to touch the hearts of the bailiffs but spite of their mother's orders the terrified children remained weeping on their miserable mattress at the unusual noise which prevailed added to the aspect of two strange men in the room the poor idiot turned herself towards the wall as though striving to hide from them uttering all the time the most discordant cries and moans 
morel meanwhile appeared unconscious of all that was going on this last stroke of fate had been so frightful and unexpected and the consequences of his arrest were so dreadful that his mind seemed almost unequal to understanding its reality worn out by all manner of privations and exhausted by over toil his strength utterly forsook him and he remained seated on his stool pale and haggard and as though incapable of speech or motion his head dropping on his breast and his arms hanging listlessly by his side deuce take me cried malicorne if that old patterer is not going fast asleep why i say my chap you seem to think nothing of keeping gentlemen like us waiting just remember will you our time is precious you know this is not exactly a party of pleasure so march or i shall be obliged to make you suiting the action to the word the man grasped the artisan by the shoulder and shook him roughly which so alarmed the children that unable to restrain their terror the three little boys emerged from their paillasse and half naked as they were came in an agony of tears to throw themselves at the feet of the bailiffs holding up their clasped hands and crying in tones of touching earnestness pray pray don't hurt our dear father at the sight of these poor shivering half-clad infants weeping with affright and trembling with cold bourdin spite of his natural callousness and long acquaintance with scenes of this sort could not avoid a feeling almost resembling compassion from stealing over him while his pitiless companion brutally disengaging himself from the grasp of the small weak creatures who were clinging to him exclaimed hands off you young ragamuffins a devilish fine trade ours would be if we were to allow ourselves to be mauled about by a set of beggars brats like you as though the scene were not sufficiently distressing a fearful addition was made to its horrors the eldest of the little girls who had remained in the paillasse with her sick sister suddenly exclaimed mother mother i don't know what's the matter with adele she is so cold and her eyes are fixed on my face and yet she does not breathe the poor little child whose consumptive appearance we have before noticed had expired gently and without a sigh her looks fixed earnestly on the sister she so tenderly loved no language can describe the cry which burst from the lips of the lapidary's wife at these words which at once revealed the dreadful truth it was one of those wild despairing convulsive shrieks which seemed to sever the very heart-strings of a mother my poor little sister looks as though she were dead continued the child she frightens me with her eyes fixed on me and her face so cold saying which in an agony of terror she leaped from beside the corpse of the infant and ran to shelter herself in her mother's arms while the distracted parent forgetting that her almost paralyzed limbs were incapable of supporting her made a violent effort to rise and go to the assistance of her child whom she could not believe was actually past recovery but her strength failed her and with a deep sigh of despair she sunk upon the floor the cry found an echo in the heart of morel and roused him from his stupor he sprang with one bound to the paillasse and withdrew from it the stiffened form of an infant four years old dead and cold want and misery had accelerated its end although its complaint which had originated in the positive want of common necessaries was beyond the reach of any human aid to remove its poor little limbs were already rigid with death morel whose very hair seemed to stand on end with despair and terror stood holding his dead child in his arms motionlessly contemplating its thin features with a fixed blood-shot gaze though no tear moistened his dry burning eyeballs morel morel give adele to me cried the unhappy mother extending her arms towards him she is not dead it is not possible let me have her and i shall be able to warm her in my arms the curiosity of the idiot was excited by observing the pertinacity with which the bailiffs kept close to the lapidary who would not part with the body of his child she ceased her yells and cries and rising from her mattress approached gently protruded her hideous senseless countenance over morel's shoulder staring in vacant wonder at the pale corpse of her grandchild the features of the idiot retaining their usual expression of stupid sullenness at the end of a few minutes she uttered a sort of horrible yawning noise almost resembling the roar of a famished animal then hurrying back to her mattress she threw herself upon it exclaiming hungry 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 
well gentlemen said the poor half-crazed artisan with haggard looks you see all that is left me of my poor child my adele we called her adele she was so pretty she deserved a pretty name and she was just four years old last night ay and this morning even i kissed her and she put her little arms about my neck and embraced me oh so fondly and now you see gentlemen perhaps you will tell me there is one mouth less to feed and that i am lucky to get rid of one you think so don't you the unfortunate man's reason was fast giving way under the many shocks he had received morel cried madeleine give me my child i will have her to be sure replied the lapidary that is only fair everybody ought to secure their own happiness so saying he led the child in its mother's arms and uttering a groan such as comes only from a breaking heart he covered his face with his hands while madeline almost as frenzied as her husband placed the body of her child amid the straw of her wretched bed watching it with frantic jealousy while the other children kneeling around her filled the air with their wailings the bailiffs who had experienced a temporary feeling of compassion at the death of the child soon fell back into their accustomed brutality i say friend said malicorne to the lapidary your child is dead and there's an end of it i dare say you think it a misfortune but then you see we are all mortal and neither we nor you can bring it back to life so come along with us for to tell you the truth we're upon the scent of a spicy one we must nab to-day so don't delay us that's a trump but morel heard not a word he said entirely preoccupied with his own sad thoughts the bewildered man kept up a kind of wandering delivery of his own afflicting ideas my poor adele murmured he we must now see about laying you in the grave and watching by her little corpse till the people come to carry it to its last home to lay it in the ground but how are we to do that without a coffin and where shall we get one who will give me credit for one oh a very small coffin will do only for a little creature of four years of age and we shall want no bearers oh no i can carry it under my arm <laughs> added he with a burst of frightful mirth what a good thing it is she did not live to be as old as louise i never could have persuaded anybody to trust me for a coffin large enough for a girl of eighteen years of age i say just look at that chap said bourdin to malicorne i'll be dashed if i don't think as he's going mad like the old woman there only see how he rolls his eyes about enough to frighten one come i say let's make haste and be off only hark how that idiot creature is a-roaring for something to eat well they are rum customers from beginning to end we must get done with them as soon as we can although the law only allows us seventy-six francs seventy-five centièmes for arresting this beggar yet in justice to ourselves we must swell the cost to two hundred and forty or two hundred and fifty francs you know the sufferer the creditor pays us you mean advances the cash old gaffer there will have to pay the piper since he must dance to the music well by the time he has paid his creditor twenty-five hundred francs for debt interest and expenses etc he'll find it pretty warm work a devilish sight more than we do our job up here i'm a most frost-bitten cried the bailiff blowing the ends of his fingers come old fellow make haste will you just look sharp you can snivel you know as we go along why how the devil can we help it if your brat has kicked the bucket these beggars always have such a lot of children if they have nothing else yes so they have responded malicorne then slapping morel on the shoulder he called out in a loud voice i tell you what it is my friend we're not going to be kept dawdling here all day our time is precious so either out with this stumpy or march off to prison without any more bother ah mademoiselle rigolette cried the weeping children as they recognized the happy healthful countenance of their young protectress and friend these wicked men are going to take our poor father away and put him in prison and sister adele is just dead dead cried the kind-hearted girl her dark eyes filling with compassionating tears poor little thing but it cannot be true that your father is in danger of a prison 
and almost stupefied with surprise she gazed alternately from the children to morel and from him to the bailiffs i say my girl said bourdin approaching rigolette as you do seem to have the use of your senses just make this good man here reason will you his child has just died well that can't be helped now but you see he is a keeping of us because we're awaiting to take him to the debtor's prison being sheriff's officers duly sworn in and appointed tell him so then it is true exclaimed the feeling girl true i should say it was and no mistake now don't you see while the mother is busy with the dead babby and bless you she's got it there hugging it up in bed and won't part with it she won't notice us so i want the father to be off while she isn't thinking nothing about it good god good god replied rigolette in deep distress what is to be done done why pay the money or go to prison there is nothing between them two ways if you happen to have two or three thousand francs by you you can oblige with him why shell out and we'll be off and glad enough to be gone how can you cried rigolette be so barbarous as to make a jest of such distress as this well then rejoined the other man all joking apart if you really do wish to be useful try to prevent the woman from seeing us take her husband away you will spare them both a very disagreeable ten minutes coarse as was this counsel it was not destitute of good sense and rigolette feeling she could do nothing else approached the bedside of madeleine who distracted by her grief appeared unconscious of the presence of rigolette as gathering the children together she knelt with them beside their afflicted mother End of chapter thirteen part one read by celine major